Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basements. This is part three in the Macintosh Repairathon series, at least the 2024 version I'm currently working on. If you haven't seen parts one and two, I recommend you watch those first because this part three is just a continuation where I left off in part two. But for a quick recap, and yeah, that's a pun intended, in part one, we took a look at this Macintosh SE here, which being a Macintosh SE, it's super reliable, so it just needed a little bit of cleanup, a little bit of touch up, and then it worked perfectly. And then in part two, we took a look at the Macintosh Classic here, which unfortunately, even after a recap of the power supply and the motherboard, well, it still doesn't work properly. It works, but there's some kind of a fault on the motherboard, and I'm looking to investigate what that is in this part. In addition, at the very end of part two, I took a quick look at the Macintosh Classic 2, the third machine we're gonna look at here, and unfortunately, it was totally dead. We couldn't get any signs of life out of either the motherboard or the power supply that's in that machine. So in this video, I hope to find and repair the faults on the classic motherboard. I don't really know where to go with that one, so I'm not quite sure I'm gonna be able to fix that. In addition, I wanna see if I can get the classic two up and running. So without further ado, let's get right to it. So here we are, we're left with the two machines that are still not working. On the left is the Macintosh Classic that even after a recap of the power supply and the motherboard, which we did in part two, here's the pile of all the bad parts and whatnot I took out of it. The power supply seems to work properly. The motherboard, on the other hand, when you power this up, you get the flashing disk question mark, you think everything is good, and you go to plug in the RAM card and immediately you get a sad Mac. And that is even if you plug in a known good RAM card I took from another system, so there's definitely some kind of a fault on this motherboard. Now, before starting this video, I took a quick look at the schematics for the Classic. And unfortunately, there's no official schematics. They're kind of a hand-drawn schematics that seem a little bit error-prone as well, but it's better than nothing. It appears that this IC right here actually is somewhat responsible for some part of the RAM subsystem. And it's very close to the caps here that were leaking. So maybe there's an issue with the trace here or the chip itself is bad. And that is just a regular commodity part. It's like an LS174, I think off the top of my head. Problem is here with the RAM subsystem on this, this large VLSI chip is really doing a lot of heavy lifting on this entire computer. Like the video passes through that, like it does basically everything. If that thing is bad, well, we're up a creek. There's no way to get a replacement one of those without taking that off another motherboard. And this chip up here is also a custom PAL chip. And that is also responsible for RAM subsystem and, and RAS, CAS, that kind of stuff. So if that chip is bad as well, then we're also screwed. There's no way to replace either of these very easily. So the only hope is that there's some kind of a bad connection, hopefully, that we can identify and fix, because otherwise, I think we might be kind of stuck with this motherboard. So that brings us over to the Classic 2. At the end of part two, I did a quick test on the whole chassis with the motherboard, and unfortunately, the power supply on its own, it just makes a weird screechy noise and doesn't actually work. When I took a look to see if the caps had leaked, indeed they had, and they had really badly. So I just sort of chalked it up to those being the problem. And then the motherboard, I actually tried this in, well, I tried it in the Mac Classic, which I know has a good power supply now because I've fixed that one. And unfortunately, the motherboard just appeared completely dead. Well, you might be noticing when we take a close look at the motherboard here that it actually looks pretty good now. So yes, I've gone ahead and I recapped this. I did it in a second channel video. So if you haven't seen that already, I'll put a link in the description below. But essentially at the end of that video, after doing the recap, I was really pleased with the outcome, but I haven't tested this thing. I don't even know if that recapping fixed this. Maybe this thing has a fault that also keeps it from working. Just like the classic motherboard, this VLSI chip here does, well, basically everything on this thing. So if that chip has gone bad, we're totally out of luck and there's no way that this thing is gonna work. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and let's just assume that hopefully the recap did the fix on that thing. As for the power supply, yep, I went ahead and I recapped this and it was actually really in bad shape. The corrosion and the, the goo had really done a number on this power supply. It was actually far worse than the one on the Classic, which we recapped in part two. This is the pile of parts that I took off the motherboard and also the power supply. And yep, all the caps were complete gushers and the corrosion situation was actually really, really bad on the power supply. A lot of other components around these also looked pretty green and crusty from the leaky juice, but I think I've cleaned it off well enough. And yeah, I've found some uh, replacement parts and just threw them in the board. 
But again, I haven't tested that, so I don't know if it works. There is one curiosity I wanna mention that I noticed here while working on the power supply. This is what plugs into the motherboard and where the harness goes and connects to the board here, it's very close to where those capacitors are that leaked. And I noticed there was a lot of green crustiness around one of the wires. And look how on the connector, one of the pins here is green. <laughs> well, <laughs> what actually happened is this yellow wire here, which I have de-pinned and I took out, it's actually corroded on the entire length of the wire. And over on the board itself, where the yellow wire attached, it was all green and crusty as well. So I'm assuming that the cap juice either went up from the motherboard, up the wire to the power supply board, or the other way around. And it probably came from the power supply board just because those caps have a lot more electrolyte in them to leak than the small surface mount caps that were on the motherboard. In addition, on the Classic 2, there are no capacitors right around the power supply connector like there were on the Classic. So it really seems like to me that capillary action took effect and it actually ran the corrosion all the way along that copper wire and right into the connector, which it has turned green. Now, fortunately, there is no corrosion of any kind inside this connector. So I don't think it's caused any damage to the motherboard. And in addition, I went and looked up what this yellow wire is because Apple doesn't always use standard colors, but it is the standard color and that is the 12 volt rail, which I'm quite sure on this motherboard is simply used for the disk drive connector and nothing else. So for now, I think there won't be any issue with us running this connector with this wire unplugged here. We just won't get functional floppy drive action out of it. So we obviously have lots to do in this video besides fixing this motherboard and then testing this whole mess over here to see if this works. Let's go with the hopefully easier thing and test to see if this power supply works now and that if this motherboard works now. And if it does, we can just rule this out as a working machine and then I can focus my attention on the classic motherboard repair. So I think the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna test this classic two motherboard in the classic. And that's because I know this power supply works. I just don't wanna deal with two potential issues here with this stuff and let's just go with the known quantity with this power supply and hopefully this motherboard just works now. Mains is connected, place your bets. Is this gonna work or are we just gonna have a completely dead system? It's on. No, it's dead. Oh, it's totally dead. Oh boy. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Oh boy. Yeah, I worried about this particular potential. When I was doing the recap, I kept saying to myself, well, what if this motherboard was already dead? Like this had some kind of a fault and all that work recapping it was gonna result in, well, this, a totally dead system. So one thing to consider is when you power up one of the old uh, 68,000 base Macs, the video circuitry on that runs all the time and it will generate a video signal no matter what. So even when the CPU is not running, if you have a good crystal oscillator on there, you're gonna see like bars and stuff. With the Classic 2, since it's based on the LC chipset, it doesn't generate any video signal at all until it actually initializes the system. Now the system was on there for a moment. Let me just feel to see if any chips feel extra hot or weird. Nope. Everything seems fine. So I think what this means is there gonna be a part four where I try to troubleshoot this motherboard. I'm not gonna do that right now. We've just identified for sure that this thing appears totally dead. All right, let's go on to see if this recap chassis works at least. I wanna have at least one win from the Classic 2. Here's the recapped Classic 2 chassis. I don't have a motherboard installed. I do have a light bulb connected to the five volt rail along with the multimeter. Let's plug this in. Let's see if this thing works now. Originally when I powered this on, I just made a screechy noise and was very unhappy. Yeah, okay, we're good. The voltage is a little low at 4.85 volts. Now that could be because some of the cap juice had made its way all around the, the voltage regulation circuit. So there is a potentiometer that I can adjust and there's a hole in the board there. It should allow me to adjust it. Let's see about the 12 volt rail here. So the blue multimeter here is connected to the 12 volt rail and is set to manual range. Yeah, 12.3. Interesting how it's a little high and that one is a little low, but again, we're missing the motherboard. The CRT is not running right now and that takes uh, 12 volts. So it could be just throwing the whole thing out of whack a little bit. 
The awesome thing is replacing those horrible leak caps and cleaning up all that messy electrolyte has resulted in a functional power supply. So that is excellent. No weird screechy noise any longer. Hmm, and I thought we could adjust the potentiometer, but it's actually right here and there is no hole in the backside of the board. It's pretty rude to be honest that they, they didn't actually put a hole there. That's all I would have taken. And then we could have adjusted that thing <laughs> from this side. I'm gonna try to make the adjustment on this thing with the board sort of out resting on this mouse pad. Please don't do this kind of thing. It's very dangerous. There's a lot of mains voltage and other high voltages flying around. So yeah, this is very dangerous, but unfortunately it's the only way to really do it. And I just wanna see if that adjustment range on the pot is actually, well, what I expect it to be. Oh, I was tweaking on the value a little bit because I was like, it's 4.94 volts now. So that, you know what, to be honest, that's actually fine. I'm just gonna leave it as it is there and let's put an actual motherboard on there. So yeah, that's one thing you can do by the way is make that adjustment while it's all unplugged and turned off and then plug it in, turn it on and see how it looks. And that's exactly what I just did. Since the Classic 2 motherboard appears to be dead, we're gonna use the original Classic motherboard here for our testing. The 12 volt wire is removed from the connector because I don't wanna plug that corroded thing into the motherboard. And here we go. Aha, interesting. Oh, okay. I wonder if this motherboard doesn't work without the 12 volt rail. Well, we're getting a good image here, so that's a good sign, but obviously the system is not booting. Let's see what the five volt rail looks like. 5.12, okay, so it was probably adjusted perfectly and I turned it up a little bit too high. And let's check the 12 volt rail. 12.47, interesting, the fan's also not running. I must have pulled the connector off the motherboard or the motherboard, the analog board when I had it out. All right, it's a little bit too high. I'm just gonna try to turn it down a little bit. 4.83, okay, I went a little bit overboard with that adjustment. Well, the scrap power supply board to the rescue, I went ahead and I stole the yellow wire out of this one, since this board will never work again. And I've gone ahead and I've installed that into this board. So I did desolder the old wire, which is right here. We'll open that up in a second, look to see if it's all green and crusty inside, which I'm sure it is. And then I tried to flush this out with some alcohol to kind of clean out the, the junk that was in there. You know, my camera just keeps stopping the recording and I don't know why. We have plenty of battery, we're at 100%. Why would it just stop? Well, anyways, I was trying to get this back in. Goes in this way. Depinning ATX connectors are difficult if you don't have the right, if you don't have the right tools. I was using these little things here. Get these from AliExpress, these little depinning things. They're like a dollar each and they suck. They really, really suck. For whatever reason, they don't have the right thing to do the depinning on ATX connectors, which is the same as this. Why? I don't know. It's not like one of the most common connectors that is around <laughs> anyways. So let me put this thing back together. We can try that classic motherboard again. Classic motherboards back in, everything is hooked back up again. Let's see if this thing, let's see if this thing works. There it is, unbelievable. I am really surprised that the classic motherboard requires 12 volts <laughs> to actually work, but there it is, it's freaking working. Uh, this CRT, yeah, this is dim. Oh, not surprised, not surprised whatsoever. Let's plug in the blue SCSI. Let's see if we can adjust the brightness in the control panel. You know, I just had a thought. I don't think we've actually booted the classic into an OS at all. All we've done is look at that flashing disc question mark. Where's the mouse? Here's the mouse. I am actually very curious to see what size of memory this thing is reporting right now. So let's see if this thing is able to boot system six, 6.07, which is what's on the blue SCSI. And I wonder if this thing's gonna show that it has all five or one megs of RAM on the motherboard, or we're gonna have some smaller amount. Memory manager error. So this sort of tells us that there may not even actually be one meg of RAM working on this system right now. Very interesting. What does that even mean? What does that particular error mean? I can't say I've ever seen that error. 
I just rebooted and uh, we're getting that same error again. So I'm just gonna plug a keyboard into this thing because there's actually an interesting little feature on the Mac Classic. I'm gonna take the blue SCSI out of here. Macintosh Classics actually have a little ROM disc built into ROM with a very minimal System 6. And it's such a minimal lightweight system that I wonder if that one's gonna run on this with this weird memory error we're getting. To access this hidden ROM disc on the Classic, you hit Command Option, X, O. I gotta push this all with one hand. I don't know why it's such a ridiculous key press combination, but when we power this on, holding down this finger breaking <laughs> key combination, it should actually, it should boot into this minimal system. Okay, there we go. And now it's booting. And that is absolutely the ROM disk that's booting. And look, it hasn't crashed yet. Oh, hey, okay. About Finder, well, first of all, can we turn the brightness up? This is really dim and it's annoying me. All right, so now that we have maxed out brightness, it doesn't actually, it doesn't look too bad. Maybe I can adjust the focus to make that a little sharper. Okay, how much RAM do we actually have? 512K, aha, so we have definitely some kind of fault here with the memory, I guess, on the motherboard. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Okay, so let's just do a quick summary of where we are just so I can get my own bearings of what's happening here. So Mac Classic Motherboard, which we recapped, seems to be working, but we're only getting 512K of RAM. When we plug the RAM expansion card into it, it gives an immediate sad Mac. So this is obviously something going on here that we're gonna have to troubleshoot. The Classic 2 Motherboard, when we put that into a known good working chassis, totally dead, doesn't work at all. We're gonna look at that in another video. I don't think I have time in this video to do that. And then as for the Classic 2 power supply, that is now fully operational, just with some new caps, a good cleaning, and of course, a fresh non-corroded 12 volt wire that goes to the motherboard. And little did I know that the Macintosh Classic, the original one requires 12 volts, which is definitely what this wire is for it to even boot. That's kind of curious, but whatever. So we've taken a step forward with this chassis, and two steps back with two bad motherboards. I fiddled with the controls on the back of this thing and I got the picture looking actually rather excellent. I turned up everything and it looked really good. I've reinstalled the plastic cover on the side here and I wrote recapped on there just, uh, well, I forgot a D. <laughs> recapped, there we go, good enough. So for the next person who ever goes to work on this thing, if that's me or someone else, they'll know that some work was actually done on this. And hey, this Mac Classic chassis, unlike the motherboard, is good to go. So it's the next day, and last night when I was cleaning up and organizing the bench a little bit, something very interesting and surprising happened. This is the Mac Classic 2 motherboard, and this is the original Mac Classic chassis. And on a whim last night, when I was just reorganizing, I decided to try this motherboard one more time, just to see what happened exactly uh, when it didn't work. And I was just doing that in preparation for thinking about the repair scenario and things that I would need to do to try to get this board working. Well, with the board in the chassis, if we turn this on now, it freaking works. It just works. I didn't, I didn't actually do anything. I just literally put it in. <laughs> and as you can see, there it is. I did absolutely nothing to the board. We tested it on video. It didn't seem to do anything. I put it aside. We were working on other stuff. And then off camera, I put it back in, turned it on, and I heard the chime. So I guess what we should do is just do a little further testing on this thing and just see if it's actually totally fully functional. Now I could be greedy and put some RAM in this because I think we only have two megs of RAM on board right now uh, with this memory right here. The original RAM, which is right here that was in this, is only one megabyte memory. So this thing only had a total of four megabytes. That's kind of boring. Why don't we try to upgrade this thing all the way to its max 10 megabytes? Here are a pair of four megabyte SIMs. Now these are the parity type, which I'm not totally sure if these will work okay in here. But I suppose let's just give it a try and see what happens. Oh, you know what? Let's put it in the actual Classic 2 chassis instead of this Classic 1 chassis, just to give it the, the full complete test. I don't love changing two things out at once because I've had a whole lot of like random problems in this video series, but let's just go for broke and let's give it a try. 
Blue SCSI is connected to, so if this thing does work with that RAM, well, we should actually have a booting computer. I'm overly confident. I'm gonna actually plug the keyboard and mouse in as well. <laughs> Let's just see if everything actually works. Just put the classic motherboard there. Here we go. Oh no, <laughs> it's not working again. Wait, <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> oh dear. Let's try resetting this thing. Nope. Oh, wait a second. Well, that was interesting. So pushing the reset button actually made it work. Why is that exactly? Hmm. So there's an interesting curiosity about the Mac Classic 2 that I think is unique to this computer of all of the black and white Macintosh machines. Like the LC, you can actually push Apple, Control, and this button here on the keyboard and it resets the computer as soon as you let go of the modifier keys. It's actually like a hardware reset. Well, at least when it's, yep, there we go. I just rebooted it again. Isn't that interesting? I don't think any of the other black and white Macintoshes can do that. And I think this is just left over from the fact that this thing came from Macintosh LC, at least the main VLSI chip on there. Now, I guess the question we have is, is that why was that first power on just sort of that garbage on screen? I hadn't seen that particular symptom yet um, using this particular motherboard, at least on the other chassis last night and this morning. And now we're getting this. Oh yeah, okay. Here's a little cool tidbit. This error is telling us that we can't use this system on this particular Macintosh. You need system 6.0.8L, some kind of long-term support version of system six, or you need something like 7.1 or newer. Well, I know a little trick that I figured out a while ago, and I don't think I've ever talked about this. If we reach in the back of the machine, we push the interrupt button. So this is the little debugger mode that is available on Macintoshes. Like you can look at some registers and stuff like that. If we just hit G for go, it's actually gonna boot the system now. <laughs> so that particular error that it was telling us that it couldn't run is some kind of BS software lock that you could easily just bypass by hitting the interrupt button and then just typing G. And that's all it takes. Let's see how much RAM we have available to us. 10 megabytes. So that RAM is working. And I think the only curiosity we have is why didn't it start that very first time? I think maybe I should power cycle this several times to see if that comes back. Power cycle attempt number one. That's working fine. Power cycle attempt number two. Again, working system. Power cycle attempt number three. Again, it's still working. Power cycle attempt number four. Yep, we're still good. I'll do one more time after this. And power cycle attempt number five. Yeah, I guess we're still good. And I'm gonna run speedometer 3.06 on this exact same system 6.07 on all three of these machines. Well, I won't be able to run it on the classic unless I can get this fixed. Just so we can compare the actual performance metrics at least with this particular app. We have a CPU score of 4.046, graphics of 3.641, disk 1.702, and math 5.934. I have noticed in the past that the performance rating you get from this and the various metrics can vary depending on what type of Macintosh system software you're running. So that's why it's best to compare these machines across running the exact same version of system 6.07 with the same set of extensions. Just for reference, here's the same blue SCSI boot image running on the Mac SE, and you can see the numbers that you get right here. So I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to do a jump cut, and in the meantime, I'm just gonna run some performance tests and games and stuff on here, just to make sure that this machine is actually working properly. And there we go, after some gaming and applications, everything appears to be working perfectly on this Macintosh Classic 2. So really we just had that power-up glitch the first time I tested it where it did nothing, and then this time when we first powered on, we had that weird garbage on the screen, and now everything works. So that leads me to say that tentatively, the Macintosh Classic 2 is fully fixed. That means we're not gonna have a part four, and now I'm just gonna put this thing back together, and then we can turn our attention to trying to get this Mac Classic fully operational. This is the test setup we're gonna be using for troubleshooting. Now, you might be wondering how exactly am I running the power supply here without a CRT attached? 
Well, that is made possible because I lifted this diode right here. And this is the diode that supplies the 30 or so volts that drives the entire CRT section of the board. So with that diode removed from the board as it is right there, currently this entire section here is not powered up at all. With the entire CRT section disconnected, we're not gonna get any kind of activity on this whole section. So this is safe to have this all wrapped up like this. I have to give a warning that if you don't lift this diode and you run this board with the high voltage anode cap just disconnected from a CRT, then you have a big shock risk because this thing is gonna generate like 15,000 volts and it's just gonna be open potential sitting right there, especially if you have the deflection yoke connected to this connector here. Now on this particular power supply, the diode here that feeds that 30 volts over here also shares the same winding with the 12 volt rail. So with this disconnected, that winding is not loaded down as much and I don't have a hard drive connected. So that 12 volt rail kind of floats up and runs at like 13 point something volts. So I hooked up one of my light bulbs here to the 12 volt rail and this is a two filament bulb. So it puts quite a load on that 12 volt rail and just moving it off to the side out of view because it's pretty bright when it's running. In fact, I made a little shield with some aluminum foil here just to keep that light out of my eyes when you turn this entire thing on. So with that connected, this actually pulls that 12 volt rail down to like 11.5 volts or so. And the five volt rail that goes to the motherboard is looking really good too. It's like at 5.06 volts. So everything is looking good. And from a safety perspective, this over here is the no touch zone of the power supply since the mains comes in here and high voltage DC is present. This is the low voltage side and this entire area over here is not connected to anything. We obviously have the main cable connected to the motherboard here and to get a video feed, since we don't have a monitor hooked up anymore, I actually have this lead connected right here, which is something I did a long time ago on this particular power supply. And this goes to the RGB to HDMI. In case you're wondering how to do that, these are the wire colors that run over here to the motherboard. And the black wire is ground, brown wire is V-Sync, red wire is H-Sync, and the white wire is the video signal. So I ran that harness over to one of these little breakout boards with those same exact colors. I do have a two additional leads hooked up that aren't actually connected to anything. That, that's for the blue and the red. I'm only feeding the video signal, which is the white wire, into the green wire. And then this goes to the RGB to HDMI. And now if we apply power to this, there we go. We get the uh, good old Macintosh beep. Now, since we're gonna be turning this thing off and on a whole lot, I actually connected up a three volt battery to the battery holder. That way I can set that ROM disc as a boot device so that when we turn this thing off, do some troubleshooting, turn it back on, it'll just always go back into the ROM disc. To set the ROM disc to boot every time, just go into the control panel once you've booted into the ROM disc and you set your startup device to the ROM disc. Let's just give this a test. Well, oops, shut down the machine, power it off, and let's turn it back on and let's just see if it boots back to the ROM disk. Great, look at that. Right back into the ROM disk. Okay, so once this boots up, let's just double check 100% that we're still getting 512K of RAM and we are indeed. So this, this machine is definitely still broken. Just for trouble or triple checking, I will plug in the RAM card here and let's see what happens when we power it up. Yep, it goes immediately to this sad Mac. So we got error code five, and I think that second number is potentially trying to tell us about a particular data bit that's bad, but I don't really believe it because when we obviously remove this card and we power the computer back up, it obviously works just fine. This tells us a few really important things. Now, when you look at this memory here, you see there's eight chips and you might think that, well, this is just one megabyte where each chip is one bit. That's actually not the case. Each one of these chips is four bits wide, and that way two of them is 256K times eight. So to equal one megabyte total, you obviously need all eight chips. Since the processor on this machine is actually a 16-bit processor, it requires 16-bit memory. So if two of these chips is eight bits, you need a minimum of four of these to actually have enough memory for this thing to work. So it is technically possible that we do have some bad memory on here, and maybe the first four chips are good, and the additional four has some type of a problem. But what doesn't make total sense is if we plug this card in and say we remove these two SIMs, then we're gonna be adding another one megabyte of memory, but it's configured in exactly the same way as on what's on the motherboard. So this is eight bits of RAM and that's another eight bits of RAM. So four of these chips is a total of 512K. Well, why when plugging this in, does it immediately fail? Now, one potential issue is that when this card is plugged in, the motherboard obviously knows that it's there. So there's obviously like a pin that's grounded or five volts or something like that. That signals the motherboard, hey, this RAM expansion card is there. So look for that additional memory that's on here. 
Well, if we're only getting 512K on this motherboard, then maybe what's happening is this additional megabyte gets added, but there's a gap where the memory is not working and that causes the machine to immediately, well, become unhappy. And whether or not there's actually SIMS installed doesn't really matter because this memory is installed above this two megabytes of memory that's on the motherboard and on the card. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to play around inside the debugging mode that's built into the Macintosh. So if you have a Mac, you might've pushed that button and seen this screen and gone like, what does this even do? Well, if you type G, that just goes back to the desktop. But there are some commands you can actually do inside of this thing. So you can type DM and this is dump memory. It actually will show us the contents of memory and we can actually set memory as well. It means we can store stuff into RAM. Now, I happen to know after doing a little bit of reading on the way the Macintosh works, and I found some documentation for the original Mac 128, which I think should be applicable to this machine, since this is just the evolution of the Mac 128. When you have, say, one megabyte of memory, the screen memory and the sound buffer memory that goes for the digital sound is contained at the top of the memory space. When you add two megabytes of RAM, it actually moves the screen buffer and the sound buffer to the top of that memory. And if you try to put four megs of RAM by using a card like this, it then moves the screen memory and the sound buffer to the top of this. And remember when we installed this card and we had the jumper set for SIMs installed, but the SIMs were not installed, we got a whole lot of like weird garbage and noise on the speaker. Well, that was happening specifically because the logic on the motherboard moved the screen memory and the sound memory up into the SIMs that didn't exist on here. And when the logic went to go read the screen buffer and the sound buffer out of the non-existent memory that was on here, those data lines were just floating. And when you have floating data lines with TTL, you're just gonna get very unpredictable results, which resulted in a whole bunch of weird static and noise and all that kind of stuff. So that is a completely expected thing to happen. Now it is pretty curious right now that the chip that's on here, this VLSI chip actually supports 512K as a configuration but I'm not really surprised because this chip here is essentially everything that was on the Mac 128 motherboard shrunk down into this VLSI chip to take place of all those individual logic chips and PALs that were on that original system. And of course the original Macintosh supported 128K, 512K, one megabyte, two megabyte, 2.5, and I guess four megabytes of RAM. Those were the valid memory configurations. Now, when you're working with Motorola 68000 based systems, one interesting thing is if you try to read memory that doesn't physically exist, the processor can actually detect that and it throws an exception that will say bus error. And we can try that by reading memory that doesn't actually exist. So we know this machine does not have any memory installed at this 300,000 hex, which would be the start, if my math is correct, of the third megabyte that doesn't exist. And when we do that, oh, okay, it's actually working. All right, well, if you try this on a later Macintosh, like with the 68030, I think the memory management unit will throw a bus error anytime you try to read memory that doesn't actually exist. But on this machine with 512K of working memory, the RAM actually goes from address zero all the way up to 80,000. Well, one less than 80,000. So if we look at this, I'm assuming here, we're just looking at the beginning of memory, like it's a mirror of the beginning of memory. And we can test that by looking at those first couple bytes there, 00F8. And I'm gonna dump memory zero, which is the very start of memory. And let's look to see if it's 00F8. It is indeed. And if we set the memory address zero, 1122, which there we go, it changed it. Now when we dump memory and we go back to that 80,000, it should be 1122. Okay, it is indeed. So this is actually a very helpful test. And here's why. If all one megabyte of memory on this machine were being addressed correctly, but say there was a problem with that upper memory, and then the system, when you powered it on, it detected there was a problem and it just decided to ignore it. So then it's only gonna address that 512K that it knows is working. If that were the case, if we set a byte into that upper 512K, which is what I did by writing to 80,000, the information that's in there shouldn't be mirrored with that lower amount. It should just write a byte of data to it and then I could read it back and we would know it's working. And if we went back to address zero, well, we wouldn't see anything. But what we can tell without a doubt is right now the computer is only addressing 512K of RAM and that's it. So we need to try to figure out why it's stuck and only addressing 512K of RAM. And I'm assuming when we plug this in, the sense pin that's on here tells it, hey, you should now have two megabytes of RAM, but it goes to talk to two megabytes of RAM and immediately that's gonna fail because it seems that the logic on the board here is only seeing 512K. And if it tries to write to the upper part of memory on here, that's actually just gonna overwrite the lower part of memory because that 512K 
is just mirrored over and over again. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised that this is mirroring over and over again as well. So if we dump memory at uh, 100,000, which should be the start of the second megabyte of RAM, I expect us to see 1122 there, and we do indeed. And if we do say 200,000, same thing, it's just mirrored again. So indeed, we're seeing copies over and over and over again of that 512K of RAM. Now here's a little interesting tidbit on the original Mac that caused that four megabyte hard limit. Apple decided for whatever reason to start the ROM address space at 400,000 hex. Well, if we go to the Windows calculator and we type in 400,000 hex, notice the decimal representation of that number. It is four megabytes. The ROM always exists unless you're in the special boot overlay mode at the four megabyte boundary. So RAM, which needs to be continuous, can only ever be from zero all the way up to that four megabyte boundary. That is the hard limit that was created with that original Macintosh all the way back in 1984. And that stuck with all the 68,000 base Macs, including this classic all the way in the 90s. The total usable address space on the 68,000, just for reference, is a total of 16 megabytes. So they kind of arbitrarily stuck stuff all over the place, probably to simplify some of the address decoding on that original motherboard, because of course it was all discrete logic well with some PALs and stuff. So to make it a bit more complex than it actually ended up being, they would have needed more decoding logic. Well, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but the reason why I'm talking about the fact that the ROM begins in the four meg space is that since this computer is actually booting, that tells us very clearly that the CPU is able to address all of the memory space. If there were a problem on one of the address lines coming out of the CPU, then what would happen is the system wouldn't even be able to boot off the ROM because none of the other logic and the ADB and all the other peripherals on here would be working because all of those exist in this upper area in the memory map, which means that the CPU's connections for the various address lines are good and they're going to various places on the motherboard. Our next step is to go take a look at the schematics for this system. I'm just gonna power it off because there's no need for me to be running that light bulb over there, making a ton of heat. We need to go look at the schematics and see where those address lines are going and focus on the memory subsystem, which on this particular system is the RAM chips itself, this PAL chip right here, which handles the column address select and some other stuff like that. And there is this one TTL logic chip right here. Those are the three main components along with the VLSI chip that do all the RAM decoding on this board. So here we are on some schematics for the Macintosh Classic, and these are third party and hand drawn, and I've already found a bunch of errors in here. But to be honest, it's far better than not having anything at all. So up here we have the 68,000 with all the address lines, all the data lines that go off to various places on the motherboard. There is this chip here, the Bob Bailey unit, the BBU. This is that VLSI chip that they integrated all those Macintosh components down into one chip. I can't be 100% sure what all the functions are of this chip, but one thing that is very clear by the schematics is that it creates this RAM data bus here, so RD0 to 15. That means that the CPU's data bus is not connected directly through to the RAM chips, it actually goes through this chip. But we know for sure that these lines are all good, and that's because without all 16 data lines, we would not get a booting system. And we are getting a booting system, we clearly have an addressing error. One of the other things the BBU does also generate are RAM addressing lines. So normally when you're using DRAM, you have to multiplex the address lines because you have rows and columns. Well, columns and rows. <laughs> so normally you would have some TTL logic like on a Commodore 64 to address the rows and the columns. But on this particular system, this BBU chip seems to be doing all of that. If you're talking to a memory board like this with one megabyte SIMs, you're gonna need addresses zero through nine, which so 10 address lines to talk to all one megabyte of memory. But if you're talking to 256K RAM chips, like the ones on the motherboard, you actually only need zero through eight or nine lines total. Now, if you think about the way the address lines work, when we go from nine address lines for 256K to 10 address lines for one megabyte, you're actually increasing the amount of memory you have access to by four. So that's how the 256 turns into one megabyte. If we were missing an entire address line that was going to the onboard memory on this motherboard, then all of a sudden these 256K chips would be divided by four and they would turn into 64K chips, meaning we would have a total of 128K available to us on this motherboard. We know that's not the case here because we have 512K of working memory. So I don't think it's a problem from the output of this chip going to the RAM that's on this motherboard. Moving to the next page, we see more of the RAM subsystem. So this is that PAL 
UL1, and this is generating those column address select lines. And then here is UH6, the 74LS174. Down here, we're looking at the onboard memory chips that are on this particular system. And here is that BBU chip from the other page, and it just shows a couple of its lines are connected over here as well. So remember, as I talked about earlier, we need a total of four of these RAM chips to equal 16 data bits, which is what's required by the 68,000 because yeah, 16 bit processor. And the way that's represented here is UK eight, six, four, and two are all part of like say the first or the second half of the one megabyte. And then one, three, five, and seven are that other half. In addition, take a look up here. You can see that this column address select pal has the sense signals for whether the SIM is installed or the memory board is installed in the system. So clearly this chip here, which unfortunately is proprietary and I don't have a replacement for, is what handles the memory map of the system when you plug that card in or take it out. Now we do have something else to consider here. Take a look at this 74LS174. It has three address lines on it that come directly from the CPU. Address line 19, 20, and 21. We are only currently seeing 512K of RAM, and that's this number of bytes right here. Now, when we look at the binary representation of that, guess which address line is important for any memory above that? It's actually address line 19. Now, if we subtract one byte from this, so that's seven FF, FF, that is the very top of the 512K of memory that's available on this system. The address lines that are currently active are A0, all the way through A18. You need address line nine and those other address lines to work, the ones that are higher than it, so you can address all of the memory. If for some reason this chip here is not getting address line 19 on this input, then it's quite possible that if this is just zero all the time, that to the computer, based on the signals that make its way over to this CAS PAL chip, that the computer will ever only see 512K of RAM. And I think what might happen is that when you plug the RAM board in, these extra signals go into the PAL chip and it tries to talk to the additional memory that is there, but is not going to be able to be addressed properly. Things will just get overwritten in that upper memory because we're going to be stuck only ever addressing 512K. That's at least what I think might be going on looking at the schematics here. Now, one thing about the 74LS174, which is right here, is it is right next to the leaky caps. So it is definitely possible that a trace was eaten away by the corrosion from those caps. But unfortunately, this VLSI chip is also right there, which means that, well, something could have been eaten away at this. And definitely that cap juice can leak its way into chips and actually cause damage in subtle and interesting ways. So I'm definitely a bit concerned about that. So we have the multimeter out here. It's on continuity mode. And the address line 19 pin goes right there to that via, and it makes its way over to the CPU. So I'll zoom out a little bit. It goes to pin 50, which unfortunately is over here somewhere. And it goes through a 22 ohm resistor, and we see 22.85 ohms. So address line 19 is definitely connected from that chip all the way through to the CPU. We may as well check the other address lines while I am at it. There we go, that is address line 20 and it's connected through properly. And now we are on pin 11, which is address line 21, which also appears to be connected, but oddly not through a resistor. So let me just check the schematics to make sure that that is correct, A21. And yep, indeed, A21 does not have a resistor, but you can see that 20 and 19 did. So everything looks like it's connected properly from the CPU through to that chip. So that's not the issue. Now, if we take a look at the other signals that are on this 74LS174, there is this RAS gate here. I think if that weren't working, uh, we would have a problem. That comes from the BBU chip down here. I don't think the thing, the computer would run at all without that signal working. So if that gate were bad or there was a connection issue. I think the next thing we probably need to focus on are these four connections here that go between UH6 and UL1. These are outputs from the 74LS174 and are obviously used by this CAS PAL chip to, well, create the memory map or do whatever it does. So I'm just gonna quickly go through, make sure that we're getting good continuity between the output pins on here and this PAL chip down here. All right, the first of the four are connected. The second of four is connected and working. The third of the four uh, is connected as well. Good continuity there. And the final fourth connection is also good. So we have good continuity between all the signaling between these two chips. We have good continuity between the CPU address lines and that chip. This is potentially a big problem since the only chip we can actually replace is a 74LS174. The CASPAL chip and obviously the BBU chip, nothing we can do about those being bad. 
Now, in case you're wondering, by the way, that maybe we have a problem in the RAM chips, I think I talked about this earlier, but just to reiterate, I am 99.9% .9 sure that is not the case. And that's going back to that programmer interrupt mode where I was looking at memory and trying to set memory. That 512K is repeating over and over and over again, which tells us it's an addressing problem and it has nothing to do with the RAM chips. If say one of the bits in one of these RAM chips were bad, well, when I tried to write some data into there, I would actually see unique data written into that memory that wouldn't then be visible back at address zero when I looked at that memory location as well. So that just really confirms that it's not a memory problem on the board. It's definitely some kind of an addressing issue that we're dealing with here. Now, one thing that is a bit of a bummer is if I turn on the system here, okay, it's working fine, but if I put the memory card in, it just right away crashes and there's no way for me to get into that interrupt mode. It'd be cool if we could like go to that machine language monitor or whatever that is and enter some commands in here so we could try to poke around the memory in this particular state. But that's all it does. And if I push on the buttons here, reset doesn't even work. Nothing does anything whatsoever. I'm actually tempted to try something rude and it's to plug this memory card in while the system is running. I think I'm going to try that. So currently it's in the slot, but it's not actually touching the pins. I'm going to wait for the system to actually boot into the OS. We're going to drop into the machine language monitor, and then I'm going to push this card into the socket. It may just completely and instantly crash the machine, but here we go. Okay. Yes, it did exactly that. <laughs> Instant crash. <laughs> okay. It looks like the error code we're getting is exactly the same as well. I was just hoping that we'd be able to like access that additional memory in the machine language monitor with the card installed, but I guess that's not really possible. And the reason why is that, remember it remaps the video into the top part of memory. And if it's unable to address this memory properly, although it is kind of interesting because it did draw that. So it's like it drew that into memory. If I pull this card out while the system is powered on, I'm predicting that as soon as I pull it out, we're gonna lose all video. And that's because it has written that crash screen into the Sims here. So here we go, pull this out. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it went right back to what we were at before. Now the system is like gonna be definitely hard locked. And I think what happened there is that the original desktop you see there is written into this onboard memory. And as soon as I pulled this out, that extra sense signal that goes to this PAL chip relocated the video buffer pointers back to the original memory on the motherboard. We just saw what was there before. But the computer obviously is completely hard locked. Obviously if I hit the reset button, I'm sure it's gonna reboot and work fine. Yeah, so that's a little bit of a curiosity, isn't it? That it absolutely had written that crash screen into this memory so that the logic on the motherboard that displays the video is working, but somehow the system is just not able to see the rest of the memory. Very curious, this problem. And again, we're looking at the memory at location zero there, so 00F8. And at 200,000, we should just see 00F8 again, and yeah, we do. So it's that repeating stuff over and over again. All right, I think what we're left with now is to start probing around on, I guess we'll start with the LS174, and we'll take a look at the inputs on there, and we'll take a look at the outputs on there, and we'll just make sure that pins 2, 5, 7, and 10 are outputting some kind of a signal that goes over to this, uh, well, you can't really see it, this CAS PAL chip down here in the corner. So I'm going to power up the system now, just make sure everything is good to go. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, we're gonna start on pin two, which was one of the signals that goes over to the CAS PAL. Obviously need to zoom in a little bit. So this signal looks fine. We see plenty of activity. Let me reboot the system here. Okay, yeah, just stuff happening. We don't really know what it's supposed to look like, but at least we're seeing some kind of a signal. We're not just seeing nothing. Okay, now I'm on pin five. This looks problematic. It's just stuck around 4.3 volts. And we see attempted activity, but not what we would be expecting. And I just verified that I'm definitely on pin five and I am. Oh, that is very suspicious, everyone. Very suspicious. All right, now we're on pin seven, which is the third output Q3 on UH6 there, the 174. And that looks fine. Let's reset the computer. Yep, we see activity. Now I'm on pin 10, which is Q4 output on the UH674 LS174, and that looks normal. So it's only 
that pin five, which is Q2, that looked completely broken. All right, now I moved over to pin four, which is address line 19, which comes from the CPU. And this looks a bit weird and suspicious. We do see some activity where it actually is high. This might be normal for the 68,000 while it's setting up address lines and stuff like that. You might get little pulses and stuff like that. And I think things are instructed to ignore it. If I hit reset. Yeah, okay, I don't know. This is probably totally normal. And here we're looking at pin six and this also seems pretty similar. Reset the computer. Yeah, okay, so I guess that's just typical. And here is what pin 11 on the 74 LS 174 looks like. So this is address line 21 coming from the CPU. And it also looks, yeah, completely the same. So here's the data sheet for the chip in question. And remember the line that looks wrong is Q2. And when we look at pin five here, which is Q2 on the schematic at least, pin five there, 2Q is paired up with pin four, which when we go back to the schematic, pin four, address line 19. And that is the exact issue we're seeing where we are having that mirror at the 512K boundary. So that kind of tells us right there that either 74LS174 is bad, so this output is just held high all the time, or unfortunately, the CASPAL chip could be bad as well, where pin three is held high due to a fault inside this IC. So where does that leave us? We have a fault that exists in either one of these two chips. The line is always high, is never pulled low. That could be happening from this chip, could be happening from that chip. Well, we have a couple of reasonable choices. I can cut the trace that goes between these two chips, and that way I'll be able to look at the output of this chip and see if that 2Q line now moves and changes properly. Or I suppose I could just take this chip off the board and try to find a replacement. Unfortunately, I don't really stock, well, any surface mount components. They're just hard to keep track of, and I really don't need them that much because I generally fix things that are all through hole. I do have some junk boards that have surface mount stuff on them. So I just went through and looked through all those boards and nothing has an LS174 on it that I could borrow. I did find one board though that is not junk that does have that chip. And it's another Macintosh Classic board. This is one I've not tested and I've taken the caps off this because they were of course leaking and I didn't have time to recap it, but it has a 174 that doesn't look like it's damaged. So perhaps using some hot air, I remove the 174 off the board under test. We borrow or steal the one from this board. And if that fixes the issue, well, then I could just order another one of these from DigiKey or whatever, and then get both of these up and running again. So against my better judgment, because I'm not very good at service mount soldering, I think I'm gonna bust out the hot air rework station. And let's first start by getting the chip off this board, the one under test. If that goes well, then I'll try the swap. All right, this is the donor board. Everything looks good under there. I definitely had a, a fishy smell from the leaky caps that were on this. I feel bad using a part off a board that also was bathed in electrolyte. At least the chip though was a different brand that was on the donor board. And then this is the board under test and everything looks really good there. No traces are broken, no pads are lifted or anything like that. That came off pretty cleanly. And here are the two chips. This is the one I just took off the donor board. That was the original one that's probably bad. Let's try to install this donor one onto here and let's see what happens. All righty, there we have it. So that was the donor chip installed. I think I did a pretty good job there. The soldering looks quite good. Very pleased with myself. I used the loop to inspect the work and everything looks good. I don't see any bridged solder connections on there. All right, moment of truth. Everything I think is reconnected so we can see if this thing is fixed. Okay. <laughs> We're getting, okay, this might be good. See how that, that pattern took a longer time? Let's see, it's booting up into the ROM disk. I left the battery connected the whole time. Uh-oh, seems like we have another problem here. We do not have any 
Apple desktop bus. Let's make sure that was actually connected all the way. Oh, okay, it was, <laughs> whoops. It was not plugged in all the way. <laughs> I thought I caused another fault. Do we have one megabyte or do we have 512K? One megabyte! That was it. That was freaking it. Let's plug in the RAM card. We should get four megabytes now. <laughs> okay, RAM card is in. Here we go. So this liney pattern we're seeing here is the RAM check that's going on right now. Now, right off the bat, we would immediately have the sad Mac falls. This takes longer when you have four megabytes of RAM. And let's see what we got. <laughs> Let's see, this thing should be fixed now. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Two megabytes. Oh, wait, the jumper. Okay, let's uh, switch the jumper on here. It might crash the computer. Yes, it did. No problem, we hit reset. <laughs> let's try that again. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, that went very quickly. It, the line pattern didn't take as long as I would have expected it to take. Four megs, four megabytes, success, freaking success. Oh, I can't believe it. Where's that chip? Where's the bad chip? Here it is. <laughs> it's a little, so tiny. I can't hold it up in triumph, but that is it. Bad 74 LS 174. We ruled out all the other potential issues like connectivity issues and things like that. And we saw the output of this chip did not look good. I'm on pin five. Let's use the oscilloscope to take a look at the output of Q2 now. There we go. The output looks good. <laughs> wow, that feels really good to actually see the problem with the oscilloscope and then have the system actually working. Let's just check right again, make sure we're still at four megs and we are. This is really cool. Now, funny thing is if I pull this jumper off now, we're gonna see a bunch of garbage, I think. Yes, we are. <laughs> that is, of course, because it remapped the screen memory and the sound memory into the lower part of memory at the top of the two megabyte buffer, which immediately caused it to crash. But hey, we're actually working. Let's hit G and go. Ah, the computer is now in a crash state. And there we have it. The Mac Classic is repaired, all back together and working perfectly. I've put it through its paces, playing a few games and running some applications and stuff on here and everything seems to be working absolutely flawlessly. I think I may have also figured out what was actually wrong with the Classic 2 motherboard not starting up that first time in both this chassis and in the other one. I'd mentioned this earlier about these power supplies on these machines, and the one real issue is that when all these caps leak down here, often some of the cap juice can get up here onto the voltage regulation circuit. And I mentioned that if you see any evidence of that, you really need to make sure you clean that whole area with either alcohol or contact cleaner. Well, I didn't do that on either of these machines. And I noticed on the Mac Classic here, when I actually went to put this thing back together, it didn't turn on one of the times. And that was with the original Classic motherboard in there, the one we had just repaired. Well, I hooked up my multimeter to the five volt rail and sure enough, it was at 4.5 volts, which, well, that's just too low. So I went to turn the voltage regulation potentiometer up, and even at the maximum setting on there, I could only get about 4.8 volts. And that right there is a clear indication that there is some of that cap juice still on the board in that voltage regulation circuit, which are those small ICs right there. So I didn't do this on camera, but I ended up flushing the whole area with a whole lot of 99% IPA, and I did it multiple times. And I just did it while the board was installed in the computer. I just sprayed a whole bunch on there, let it sort of drain out the bottom, and I just repeated that several times. And at the end, when all the alcohol had dried, I sprayed a bunch of this QD electric cleaner on the whole area, including on the potentiometer right there. Then I set the potentiometer back to the middle position, and when I turned on the computer, well, it was running at about 5.02 volts, and it was nice and stable and not drifting at all. So I went ahead and I did the same thing on the Classic 2 because I hadn't washed that whole area down either, and this thing I noticed was also drifting around. And after the cleaning, its 5 volt rail was also rock solid. So again, to reiterate, if you recap either the Classic 2 or the Classic power supply, you make sure you wash that voltage regulation area really good because even though on both of these, it didn't appear that there was any of the gunk on that area, clearly it was having some kind of an effect because the 5 volt rail was drifting all over the place. 
Well, that brings us to the end of our journey on the Macintosh Repair-a-thon, at least the 2024 version. The experiences we've had here has reconfirmed my assumption that the Mac SE is pretty much one of the most reliable of these classic style Macintoshes and pretty much the one to get if you're looking to get into these machines and avoid having to do a bunch of work. As you saw, the Classic and the Classic 2 required quite a lot of work to get those things working. And of course, the Classic had that failed ship, which I don't know if that was related to the cap leakage or not, but the fact is that LS-174 was very close to those leaking capacitors. So I kind of have to make the assumption that it was related. The chip that failed, which I have in my fingers right here, it was a Motorola part. So if you happen to have a Macintosh Classic that has the same symptom of 512K of RAM, and you have this Motorola LS-174 in there, Maybe you can make the assumption that this chip is the problem. Although you should definitely check all the connectivity of those traces like I did in this video, just to make sure that that's not one of the problems because maybe the chip is fine and you just have a bad connection. Hopefully you found some of these videos interesting and informative and will hopefully guide people in the future on repairing and getting these machines up and running. That's really my goal in making these videos. Well, and of course that these three machines were ready to be recycled and now they've been saved. So if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are thrown beside the screen. Subscribe if you haven't already. You know, all the usual YouTube stuff. My patrons make it possible, by the way, that I do this full time now. So a huge thank you to them. You can support me if you want. There's a link in the description below. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, I realized I forgot to cut into this yellow wire that I replaced because I wanted to check to see if there was corrosion in here. Well, I'm not totally sure, actually. I don't really see anything in here, although I would have assumed that these were copper wires and everything has a silver coloring to it. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. Either way, I didn't like the corrosion that we saw on both ends of this wire, so I'm glad I replaced it.